So good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I must say it's a pleasure to see so many young, bright faces in the European Parliament, um, especially as together with the European Commission and ESA, um, EU40 as an organization of young members of the European Parliament is trying to enhance participation of youth and young people in politics. I'm sure you're especially here because of the European Parliament, the Commission, not because of the astronauts and Mr. Koenig, which I will introduce to you soon. And for us, it's an incredible honor um, to have these people here. Both have given us inspirations in all sorts of kinds. Probably most of you are too young to have grown up with Star Trek. Uh, personally, I was lucky enough um, at least to be maybe the second or third gener second generation seeing it. And um, who would have thought that when we talk about science and what science, how it can inspire people, that we would actually have an event in the European Parliament. But I believe it is utmost crucial that we consider also how can we enhance and how can we foster the creativity and the brightness of young people in Europe. We don't have oil, we don't have gas. Our biggest asset is what you have in your heads and what you're going to make out of it one day in your lives. So actually, being the future of the European Union, it's great to see you all around. Especially when I think about inspirations, who would have thought when watching Star Trek on TV and being a kid going to school, you actually would one day have communicators and other things which were developed and given as ideas on these fantastic TV series. Also, it's a great, great honor to have three astronauts from the European Space Agency here who actually in everyday life try to extend borders of mankind, who have participated and given us beautiful pictures to see or to let us know actually how our Earth looks from above. And I envy each one of you for having had this view in your life to be able to see on what beautiful planet we're all living. So without further delay, let me please introduce <coughs> who we have. To my left, I have Katarina Nevedalova, who will moderate the event this uh, evening and who I have to especially thank for the initiative she has took up. It was her idea to get all you, Star Trek, ESA, and the Commission here, and if anybody deserves any credit for organizing this, it is Katarina together with the team of EU40. I am especially uh, honored to have Mr. Walter Koenig sitting to Katarina's left. I don't know if any introduction is needed. Some people might even know Mr. Koenig better as Starfleet Commander Pavel Chekhov. Um, and I'm very, very happy that he, who has been an inspiration to generations of scientists, is with us this evening. Thank you very much for being here, Mr. Koenig. <laughs> to the left of Mr. Koenig, you will find André Kupas, one of the members of the European Astronaut Corps, born in 1977, which actually frightens me. You're, 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 you're as old or as young as my younger brother. And, and to see what you have achieved being one of the person, I believe also the European with the longest time actually outside in outer space, right? That is, uh, must, must be an incredible experience. I'm hopefully to hear from that. To the left of Mr. Kuipas, you will find Andreas Mogensen, also, as you see, an astronaut, in this case from Denmark, giving us the true perspective of a European space agency and the European dimension of working together. And last but not least, in terms of the ESA crew, I have Belgium astronaut Frank de Vinne to my far right, uh, who has been uh, commander of the ISS, uh, which I believe is a fantastic honor, first of all, to do so, but it's even more an honor that coming from the ISS, you actually came down to the lowers of the earth in the European Parliament to join us this evening. It's a fantastic honor to have all three of you with us, and uh, I believe seeing how Europeans can work together to achieve the best, you are living examples of what we can achieve 
in these terms. So thank you three for being here with us this evening. Thank you very much. It's an honor. <laughs> And because all these achievements cannot be made without a body coordinating it, without the scientific input giving into a legislation process, without knowledge, our legislation wouldn't be worth the paper it's written on. And to ensure that there's knowledge behind what we're doing, I'm very, very uh, proud to have Professor Ann Glover uh, sitting to my right here. She's a chief chief scientific uh, officer of the European Commission and directly um, is advising Commission President Barroso on scientific issues together with her team, which I welcome also very, very much here. Without the European Commission, this event wouldn't have been possible in the way it is. So we do owe you very, very much thanks and credits for being also here with your team who actually dress up very, very appropriately um, in honor <laughs> of Mr. König and the ESA astronauts. And I believe yourself, you have a small token of honor on your right ear, yeah. but it's just something I have had a glimpse at a look at. So Professor Glover, thank you very, very much for being with us this evening. <laughs> So that was probably uh, one of uh, my tasks today. I am proud to hand over to Katarina, who will uh, lead us through the event. And uh, actually, it's your baby. Get it going. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to see so many nice people in this room. Uh, we are happy that you came and you would like to attend our very nice event. Uh, I don't need to introduce the people who were just introduced, but I just want to say that it's a big honor for me to be here in a parliament with you, with these people sitting around this table. I I'm so happy, really. This is one of my dreams uh, when I was a child. So my dream came true already, which is nice. But uh, with, uh, without very long uh, intervention, I would like to give a floor to Mrs. Clover for setting the mood, as we call it, for her uh, introductory speech. Please. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, President, uh, Vice President Alvaro, and also our astronauts uh, who are here today. And also, welcome to you. Um, you are hopefully uh, the future and able to deliver the science of the future from the audience. So what have we here? Uh, we have an incoming transmission. And what I want to do is to set the scene a little bit about how Star Trek, which is a science fiction series which went on to films and further series, how that science fiction actually excited people about science. It certainly excited me. And I am old enough to be able to say that I thoroughly enjoyed the first series, which I'll show you some from in a minute. So if we move on to the next slide, then you can see that from my point of view, one of the most important things that we have in terms of inspiration are the stars. So on our following slide, then we think about space. Now, don't underestimate space. When you look up at the night sky, you're time traveling. Remember that. You're looking into the past. And in fact, if we look at the sun, never directly, of course, if we look at the sun, then it's <coughs> taken light eight minutes and 20 seconds or so to reach us. So we're looking back into the past. And that's an exciting thing that we can do. But if you think about space, and you think about it from our own beautiful planet, and let's see that now on the next slide, then this is what our astronauts are lucky enough to have seen, and that the rest of us really can only dream about. Um, this is a lovely Class M planet. So what's a Class M planet? Well, M, uh, Minshara, of course. For those of you who speak Vulcan, you will already know this. But this is a, a, a planet that can support life. And planets would be an example Earth, or Vulcan, or Cardassia, or in fact the planet Bejor. And I'm wearing some very nice Bejoran jewelry today, a Bejoran earring. earring. So we have this planet, and one day, if we look at the next slide, people on the planet look up, and they start to wonder. And on the next slide, then they get inspired. It's so easy to look out into a world of mystery and think, 
What's going on there? And then if we, if we carry on and look at the next slide, then we wonder how could we go and have a look at what's out there? And all this led one person to think about how that could be brought to all of us. And we see on the next slide, Jean Rodenberry, who of course thought about Star Trek in 1966 was when the first uh, series started and I, I was just 10 then. But I was telling people earlier, I was 10 years old, but uh, my mother was also a big Star Trek fan. And when Star Trek was on, we would not leave the house. We didn't have video recorders or CD <laughs> recorders in those days. You just didn't leave. So no matter who invited you anywhere, this was what we watched. So that was the vision. Let's move on now and think about um, what that vision delivered to us and what we were inspired by. And it has inspired generations of scientists and engineers. And I want to give you just some flavor about what's in store for some of you. And I notice there's a lot of people in this audience who might still be thinking about career choices. And I would say one thing to you, that there is no more creative thing you could do with your life than do science. And I'm going to give you examples of just that. Because many people say, of course, you, you can't predict the future, but you can invent it. And let's see what Star Trek thought the future would look like and what's happened. So if we move on to the next slide. OK, we have an example there of science fiction, a communicator on the left. But on the right, what do we have? It's something that we all use every day that's almost welded to us and we can't do without. Let's look at the next example. So can we do wireless communication? Well, yes, here we have Lieutenant Uhura on the bridge of Star Trek Enterprise with her communicator in her ear. And again, that's how we do hands-free communication or wireless communication nowadays. Another example we would see would be the Star Trek version of Skype on the left and on the right, what again we mostly do every day. So we can talk to anyone anywhere on the planet and probably anywhere on the International Space Station as well using just such technology. So um, this is imagination in the 1960s being transformed by scientists, by engineers, by technology, technologists into the future. Another example would be here, for example, a, a, an interesting one for me, a video conference. Now, you can see the Star Trek crew having their video conference, and on the table, very much the same thing that we see today. There are some coffee cups and also some control boxes that look as if they were modeled in the modern day version on the Star Trek uh, images. Another example, if we move on, would be something that I would like to see introduced very quickly, but the needless injection. So uh, this was part of the first series of Star Trek where we could just psh and inject our drug. And what we see on the right hand side is a report of uh, an injection technology that would be needle free and would allow injection of drugs at different depths in the skin. Um, how fantastic is that? And how many of us would like to see that really quickly into our doctor's surgeries and our hospitals? Another example would be uh, what we have here. And I'll take you through the, the Kirk pad. And then next to that, the Picard pad. And then we have the Janeway pad. Let's hear it for the women. And then we have the iPad, which nowadays, uh, again, all of us, it's hard to go out without that ability to be able to communicate uh, with everyone and everything. But it's predicted here in a science fiction series. Let's have one or two more examples. And again, the tricorder. And uh, I have my colleague, uh, Dr. Jan Marco Muller, who's just going to do a quick swipe of his tricorder in the audience. And I think he'll tell us, Jan, how many life forms? 400 life forms in the room today. So that's on our left. 
But on the right, we have effectively something that is very similar to a tricorder, so a personal computer along with sensors, biosensors, to be able to input information into the database. So all of these things, it's, uh, it's almost eerie how we can deliver what the imagination can think up. A next example would be something like uh, cloaking. Now, here's a, an interesting one. How many of us have often wanted to be somewhere, but not to be seen? Well, imagine if we had cloaking devices. So uh, Klingons were famous for this, of course, in being able to use these cloaking devices. But now we do have the ability to try and obscure the image or presence of something. That effectively is a cloaking device. And another example uh, which is just being developed is, you know, can we use a tractor beam? And we've already been doing this for some time. So we've been able to use beams of light to pick up individual atoms and move them, admittedly, just atomic distances. But this group in Australia have come up with a technology also moving light to be able to grab hold of something small and move it a meter and a half or so. So the, all, the whole idea of tractor beams is not science fiction. It is now coming to be reality. A last example perhaps would be something about holodeck programming. So how many of us have thought how nice that would be to have a holodeck that you could just open the door to when you went home and be on the beach on a Caribbean island, perhaps, or be on another world in Bejor, where I could buy some more jewelry, uh, perhaps. So we can do, of course, 3D imaging. That's quite possible. So we can have holograms here in the room. And we do have the technology. I could be a hologram, for all you know. You wouldn't know until you tried to touch me. And that's what this is about is that new technology, and we're talking about this year, has come up with the opportunity of using um, ultrasound to be able to give you the impression of touching when you were in this fabricated world. So we might well be able to do things like this. It's great fun to think about, but just a serious moment here. Um, we all know about climate change. We all love to go on holidays. And every time we go on a holiday to a foreign destination, we often take airplanes. They cause a lot of global pollution. There may be a time when that's not possible for us. So how do we satisfy our demand for adventure and excitement? It could be through the holodeck. So if we move on to the next slide, uh, teletransportation, all of us would love to do this. Actually, you can do it. So again, it's not people to far off places, that would be truly wonderful. But at the moment, at least we can take small things, again, molecules, and we can move them, we can make them disappear and reappear quite some distance away, uh, many kilometers. So the, the, again, how, how exciting that we can do that. Another example would be uh, speed of light. How many of us have wanted to travel at warp speed? And I know that that's one of the things that inspired uh, Frank Devin to think about uh, space travel. Well, can we move faster than the speed of light? Well, let's have a look. And on the next slide, yes, look, particles break the speed of light limit. So this was work done at the Gran Sasso Laboratory in Italy and in CERN in Geneva. And many of us were excited for a very long time about this, many months. And let me tell you just a personal story. Before I joined the commission, I was chief scientific advisor for Scotland. And our first minister of Scotland said to me, you know, Anne, in the whole time you've worked as chief scientific advisor, you're very reluctant ever to talk about certainty. You're always talking about uncertainty, because scientists love uncertainty. And he said, could you not tell me one thing that's certain? Just tell me one thing. And I said, no, I, I, don't, I don't want to. And he said, please, you're leaving soon. <laughs> Just tell me one thing. So I said, against my better judgment, I said, OK, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. This was announced the next day.
So uh, I had a, an immediate loss of credibility. But if we move on to the next slide, I was right. <laughs> Nothing travels faster than the speed of light. So scientists, again, they identify something that looks interesting and mysterious, and they work hard to think, is it true? Is it real? And in this case, no, it wasn't real. So at the moment, nothing can travel faster, speed, faster than the speed of light. So let's move on. And um, I would have to say that Star Trek didn't always deliver useful things to us. And uh, here's an example of the Tribble, one of the most favorite extraterrestrial life forms. The, the Tribble had nice purring noises. Most alien life forms, sentient ones, love Tribbles. Uh, apart from Klingons, as you might imagine, who thought they were mortal em enemies of the Klingon Empire. Tribbles are very, very good at eating and reproducing. And that's it. So, uh, Star Trek wasn't all, perhaps, good ideas. Let's move on. And to explore new worlds, as we've seen on Star Trek, I just want to bring you back to reality. Although, I hope you see that we've been able to imagine things and then deliver them. So we can imagine and, and create reality. What do we do in Europe? And this, sometimes, you know, we're a bit too modest in Europe. And we think, oh, it's not us. We don't do much. What, what Europe does is fundamental in terms of generating the highest quality of knowledge which moves our planet forward. Now, I want to tell you just a little bit about how we make the future happen. If we look at the next slide, the International Space Station, and we're so lucky to have people here who have been to the International Space Station, but we contribute in Europe to the largest research infrastructure in space. To be part of this is quite something. And it delivers not just a knowledge of our universe, our planet, Earth observation, it also delivers understanding about human medicine, lots of other areas. We shouldn't underestimate this. If we move on and look at uh, more infrastructure, on the next slide, then, uh, and please move on to the next slide. Um, we think about, I mentioned already, the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. Um, no individual country could deliver this. It's only through working together that we can bring the best minds in the planet here together to be able to deliver this infrastructure to, what is it, what's the point of uh, the Large Hadron Collider? It's to understand the fundamental nature of matter. Because let me just remind you, and I can never forget this, is that this bench that we are leaning on, this is 99.99% nothing, as is my hand but it's not going through. And we really didn't understand why that was. We didn't understand why, what, what contributed to matter. And if we move on, we find out that the Higgs field or the Higgs boson particle, we now have identified something that really seems to give us an explanation of what gives things mass. Does it matter? Well, if we look at the next slide, I'd say yes, it does matter. Because if you understand what gives something mass, you can think about manipulating it. At the top right there, I think you see someone levitating. So you might be able to think about how you manipulate how mass interacts with gravity. But it would also be useful, coming back to climate change. If I were to move this bench, it would take a lot of energy because it's very heavy. If it only weighed one gram, it would be a lot easier. I could transform it to one gram and transform it back if I thought about how, how to do that. So let's move on to the next slide. Nuclear fusion. This is a dream. It's a dream that we've had for a long time. It's how we can force matter together to release energy without waste. Um, this is a, a real goal because to do this would give us an energy supply that does not substantially damage our planet. So if we move on, then that energy supply cannot just give us our energy supply, but will also do things like fuel space travel, where you need uh, energy over a long period of time. On the next slide, 
We have the very large telescope infrastructure uh, in Paranal in Chile. And there, what we do is we use instruments on Earth to look at our universe. And th this is a fantastic thing. It's allowed us to identify, if we look at the next slide, um, potentially planets which could support uh, life as we have on Earth. And it's great that we can look at other universes and we can identify using telescopes that we have um, slight movements. We can identify stars. It's very hard to identify distant planets, but we can sometimes see the stars being moved a little by the gravity of the planets. And this has allowed us to identify such a, a, a potential uh, life-supporting <coughs> class M planet. On the next slide, here's our challenge then. Um, we do need imagination. We do need science. We do need technology. Why? If we look at the next slide, we have a lot of problems on our planet. Uh, we are moving towards a population density on the planet that it's almost impossible to sustain. How do we do that? How do we deal with conflict, with hunger, poverty, environmental disasters that we, we see in our planet today? We need solutions, and science delivers those solutions. On the next slide, Star Trek gives us the most fantastic set of role models about how we can work together across cultures, we can break down barriers, we can find common languages. If we move on to the next slide, then here, here's a great example for me. So one of my favorites, this won't surprise you, uh, the top left there, that's Scotty, the Scottish engineer, who kept those di-lithium crystals going in order to give Captain Kirk full warp speed. So nothing defeated Scotty. He delivered what was asked of him. And if we just look, I, I won't mention each one. It might be interesting um, to think about on the bottom right. It doesn't seem so strange to us there, Captain Kirk kissing Lieutenant Uhura. At the time, this was the first ever televised kiss of a black woman with a white man. And it was seen as utterly amazing. Uh, how we've moved on from uh, 1966, I think that was. And in the middle, female Star Trek captains, uh, Captain Janeway. Bottom left, doesn't matter if you've got a disability or top right, just doesn't matter. You can contribute completely to any environment. And our next slide, a lot of people have been inspired by Star Trek. So we have familiar faces, I think, there. I just want to mention uh, top right and bottom right. We have uh, Stephen Hawking, of course, who actually appeared in uh, Star Trek in one episode of Star Trek, playing cards, I think, with data. And uh, bottom right, King Abdullah of Jordan. He's a Trekkie. And he also appeared in a Star Trek um, uh, episode. And of course, President Obama with Lieutenant Uhura there in the middle. So we have a huge number of people who have been inspired, as I hope we're all inspired. And if we move on, then Star Trek, I hope, will continue to inspire future generations. But you know, real life science should be inspiring you as well. And I think that we need, to, we need to set our gaze on science. It's not something that's happening that we don't know about. It's something that you can be part of. All of us, doesn't matter whether you're young and you become a scientist, doesn't matter if you're older and you're just interested, because it's fundamentally part of human culture. It's what makes us human. It's the same as music, poetry, sculpture, literature. Science is culture. So, Finally, we move on. One last message from Captain Jean-Luc Picard. And although he couldn't be here in person today, we have Dr. Jan Marco Muller in the audience from my team, who is doing a very good impression of uh, Captain Picard, apart from the hair, Jan, which he refused, he refused to shave. And actually, I would like to, I think it's obvious, <laughs> Look, <laughs> looking at Jan Marco, that uh, he was very, very inspirational in being able to help me with this presentation. Please 
Think about science and what it can do for you and how it can make your life, every European citizen's life, and everyone on the planet can make their life better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Clover. It's, um, it was a really great presentation, and uh, we just discussed here, like, there is uh, very little to say more about <laughs> why, why we are here today. So I will open a floor for the questions now, so you think about it. And the first question is mine as a moderator, so I will reserve this, this right. So uh, we know that we are all inspired by Star Trek, but what inspire people sitting here? And we start with the Star Trek representative. So, Mr. Koenig, what inspired you in your life? Where am I going? What is uh, I'm inspired by a Star Trek scene where Captain Kirk is standing in the background. <laughs> That's very inspiring to me. No, I tell you, I tell you what, um, I tell you what, uh, it does inspire me. I'm at, I go to a lot of conventions, and people come up, and they say, um, I got, I got, I became a fan of Star Trek because my father and my mother watched it, and uh, that was the one show they let me stay up for, and uh, we bonded uh, on that show. And I thought, wow, that's, that's really wonderful. It's, it speaks about a, a whole lifetime. It, n not only have you found a, a common, a, a, you know, a common a, a appreciation, but it, it, it solidifies your relationship and makes you more of a family. And that's what, that's what Star Trek is saying, in effect. So we, we, we see it working in a, uh, in a different way. You see, the fans not only, not only embracing Star Trek because it shows a crew, an international crew of, of uh, a very, very, and a varied crew uh, racially and nationally and culturally, and we see that they can get together and, and, they, and they can work together. And I think that you know that's it's, it's it's very important as it has been because we haven't gotten past that. I, we we just haven't gotten past it. Uh, we still need those kinds of models and that confirmation and affirmation that um, uh, folks of different um, different uh, upbringings and different sets of thinking can find a way to work together in a, in a loving manner. And you're, you're, you're seeing that on the screen at the same time you're living it with your family, when, when, when this is true. I'm sure it's not true in every family. But I've heard it enough times to, to be impressed by the idea that people who watch the show together they have something to talk about for, for the next 30 years. And uh, it's, it, it certainly is a testament to the, the quality of the, of the television they're watching and to, to the bonds they have created. I think I said something. <laughs> Thank you very much. As I see no hands, I will ask Frank, how can we inspire? Okay, is there any question? Okay, Emilia? Okay, Emilia Andersdotter there is uh, the colleague of us. She is a member of the European Parliament, uh, currently the youngest member of the European Parliament. We are happy you're here, thanks. Thank you for, um, for, thank you for that kind introduction and thank you for uh, allowing me the time to speak uh, also. So I think Professor Glover made it uh, perfectly clear that the future is already here. Uh, but it's one aspect of the future that has been missing from the presentation of our distinguished guests. 
both Alexandra Alvaro and uh, Katerina Nev Nevadalova um, have mentioned that they're inspired by television. Professor Glover talked about uh, the time when there were no VHS recorders. Um, I've watched Star Trek, the original series, The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and associated films on the computer. I've seen Farscape, Babylon 5, and Welcome to Paradox, a very intelligent filmatization project in Canada, uh, which made uh, television short films um, of science fiction short stories from the 1970s with a political content. Because of file sharing, me and many of people from my generation have been able to take part of the cultural content that was available on television for uh, people in the 1970s, the 1980s, and the 1990s. Uh, and it, it's perhaps telling that the immense impact of our ability to accumulate and relate to culture from earlier generations, and I use this concept with caution because actually neither Alexander nor Katerina are exceptionally older than me. We're more or less almost like the same age. Well, I, so, but there's not the big, and, and, and still, because of the things that you mentioned, there's no VHS recorders, um, the, 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 the television, it's, it's actually difficult sometimes for people my age to find the culture where we can relate. I started out in my teens and was very inspired by all of these science fiction contents that I found in all corners of the internet and wanted to become a physicist, an engineer, and a mathematician. I learned a lot about computers and I ended up in politics. Why is this? Because at events like this, when we talk about the immense cultural impact of Star Trek on me and my generation, actually uh, the battle lines there are more about our access to this content in the first place. Um, the tactical officers have always been my favorite characters in all Star Trek uh, series. Um, Commander Pavel Chekhov and Commander Worf have been very inspiring to me uh, in the way that they deal with their tasks uh, and also in the way that they're able to uh, deal with um, tactical decisions and conflicts. And I just wanted to raise this. Uh, I don't want to hijack, of course, an important um, space debate with uh, the internet rights issues, but it is very important that we keep cultural sharing in mind. Thanks. Thanks, Amelia. Other questions? Okay, I would like to say one thing about uh, the people sitting in this room. Uh, I'm coming from Slovakia, so I need to say this. Uh, I have a students from Slovakia who did a very, very difficult competition to get a seat sitting in this room and they needed to write down what can inspire people and what can be the invention, the biggest invention in the next 10 years in the world. And all of them, they needed to write an essay and those are 15 uh, winners of this competition. So I would like to ask them to stand up and they really deserve a big applause because they were all inspired and inspiring. And I can say that I was very proud as the Star Trek fan that many of the ideas they put on paper in their essays were inspired by Star Trek. So like a cold fusion and uh, uh, mess and anti-mess and stuff like that. So it was really very, very nice to read. And, uh, but some of them really did uh, something very inventive, uh, especially the ladies, which was very nice. I like that. Um, so my question can be for Frank. Uh, how can we inspire young people to go for science? After you've seen the video of uh, Professor Glover, which was gr very great, how can you inspire? Because you are the inspiration for many people. Um, maybe to say that uh, Frank is very popular in Belgium and also outside Belgium as uh, the first uh, European commander of uh, International Space Station. So he's a very popular person. So what can you say to young people to go for, for, for science, please? Well, I, I think like we have also seen with, with Star Trek uh, what is inspiring for, for young people and what uh, can enthusiasm them for science and technology is role models. I think role models play an important role. Uh, for us it was characters from, from scientists uh, from Star Trek, but it can also be real role models. And the fact I think that uh, sometimes young people think that science is boring, mathematics is boring when they sit in, in high school. Uh, we can show examples of people that have done scientific careers uh, like myself, engineering careers, that have a very exciting life. 
and that uh, have uh, a life that uh, is even taking us be beyond this, uh, this planet. Uh, and that, I think, is, is very important for, for the younger people. Uh, of course, not everybody, unfortunately, today can become an astronaut. I hope that in the future many more of us will all be able to fly to space. Again, who would have thought 100 years ago that any citizen, or almost any citizen, from the European Union could take an airplane and go and fly? Uh, but today it's reality. Maybe in 100 years anybody can go and take a rocket and take a trip to space. Uh, why not? I hope that once we master gravity, uh, like uh, with the Higgs boson, and we start to understand it, that we can then manipulate it, and then we can then find other systems than just the standard rockets to fly to space. And maybe it comes uh, much cheaper and ecologically friendly. So uh, I think th this is all these future ideas and that scientists, young people, can work in these domains, can invent things, that they can say that I have contributed to making this happen. This is what is the excitement of, uh, of scientists and, of course, role, role models like uh, the European Astronauts or European Astronaut Corps, ESA, we are happy to play that role and to be here present and, and to share this with as many young people as we can. Uh, but I think also the scientists themselves that work in the laboratory should also come out and be role models for the young people. We should do a lot more communication about the excitement of science, not just the small results here or there, but what it has actually contributed to the personal life of the people that are listening, but also to the people who are doing it, and that people then get excited, says, yes, I want to be part of this future. This is what we need to, to do to inspire young people. Frank is really inspiring person. And so if I don't see any hand, ah, I see one. Please, can you also introduce yourself? Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Patrick Murray. I work in the External Action Service, but I had the privilege to work for 10 years in a minor job on the, the JET joint undertaking, which was the precursor to ITER. And as a fan of Star Trek, I would say, I don't think I've ever seen the Federation tell Captain Kirk that he doesn't have a budget to go there, you can't go there, it's, uh, you've got to come back. Uh, how frustrating is it for, for these for eminent scientists to, to be, have their ambitions restricted or postponed by budget restrictions and politically motivated budget changes, just when you're on the cusp of, of a major breakthrough? Okay, th thank you for that. I'll, I'll try to just make some comment. Um, science is funded, research and development. You're, you're right. It's, it's almost our imagination is so great that we could do with a nearly infinite budget to be able to, to I suppose, to supply the demand that is out there. But each member state has priorities in research and development and they fund that. And I particularly applaud member states who have decided to either maintain or increase investment during difficult times in science, because it's a direct recognition that what they are doing is they are protecting themselves for the future, and they will be able to get out of the financial crisis quicker. Um, I, I think there is a plenty of evidence that that is the case. But what do we do here in, in the European Union and uh, through the Commission? We fund framework programmes. And many of the things that I've shown you are, for me, very exciting. We couldn't do them as individual member states. But probably just as important, if we look at the budget for the framework programmes, it has been the last framework programme around 55 billion euros over the period of the programme. The framework, the next framework program, Horizon 2020, the budget that has been identified for that is 80 billion euros. Now, that hasn't been agreed, the budget. What I hope very much, because it will be deba debated soon, is that the politicians in Europe, even in difficult times, will identify that that budget allows us to do things that we can't do in individual member states, and it does allow us to grasp some of these very big opportunities. And although you're right, nobody ever, well, 
We never saw anybody telling Captain Kirk he didn't have a budget to do things, but it was fiction. We all know there's a budget in real life. Um, we, we do know we have to work within boundaries, but science is becoming more and more imaginative about how we do things and what we deliver and who we partner with. So it's not just the public environment that funds us now. We also work closely with business and other investors, and that's a good thing as well, because then we can put science to work. So um, it is difficult times. I'm a scientist, so I'm an optimist. And I'm very much hoping that we see a good settlement for Horizon 2020 in forthcoming discussions. Thank you. Uh, a question? Oh, so that was the first. Sorry, please. Till you solve the problem, we will take the other one first. Oh, okay. okay. Um, you Can you please introduce yourself first? Oh, my, my name is Dr. Julia Reed. I'm a research biochemist, and um, <clears throat> I would just like to say that to encourage people into science, there needs to be a better career pathway for people. Because so often you spend eight years getting a PhD especially in the UK, you're lucky if you're on 20,000 a year. And having worked as a postdoc for 10 years in charge of a research laboratory, I was only on 30,000. And many of my colleagues from university who studied law or went into an accountancy do far better. And the entire time that I was working, I was on what's called soft money. I never had a secure job. So from one year to the next, I didn't know if I was going to have a contract, if there was going to be funding. Various projects that I started just finished because the funding dried up. And invariably, at my age, it's just women who have got a husband to rely on, who's got a secure job, that stay in science. Because many of my colleagues who had a wife and family, eventually they just had to abandon science and go and get a real job, as they said, and some of them actually end up working as gas fitters, because at least as a gas fitter, you know you're going to get a decent salary every month that you can rely on. So I think if we want to encourage young people into science, there needs to be more security and, and jobs that are real jobs, not just funded on money that can suddenly just disappear. So. Thank, thank you very much for that comment. And working on the budget committee, believe me, we haven't experienced how money suddenly disappears. So, so what, what we actually want to achieve is that the money is there. Professor Glover mentioned the 80 billion. What we cannot do is tell any employee, employer, you have to give this amount of salary to a certain uh, researcher, scientist, or whatever. This is something where politics basically cannot interfere. We cannot say, you must pay 40, 50, 60,000 pounds a year, euros, to do this job. But what we can do as politics is to, also our idea is that we can inspire sort of the work environment to see that there's a value behind what's going on there. That this research which has been done, that this leads to products, that this leads to possibilities, that this will bring Europe at the forefront. You mentioned lawyers. I was trained a lawyer, and uh, well, now I'm in politics, it's still less than as a lawyer, as you then know. So, but the idea is, what we don't want is that people just take jobs because of the money. I do understand that people have to live. There we, there we agree. I mean, it cannot be that as a working woman, you're dependent on your husband. That's also why the European Union is very much forcing on equal pay between women and men. It's impossible that the educated women, as educated as a man, earns 25% less. This is ridiculous in a civilized environment as the European Union. So this is something where we have to push much more on. But I do believe that if we manage to get through, together with the Commission, the 80 billion which are needed for research and which can invest there, if we show that we can create added value, if we can show that we actually want to have 
Silicon Valleys in Europe, not only working on IT and computer issues, where uh, a lot of us have already have a focus on, but where we have centers of excellence in medical research, physics, chemistry. We have, I am from my member state, I know it in Germany, the Max Planck Institutes, the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft, who are doing so much on research and work, and people want to work there. So I am not sure, and I, or let's put it this way, I'm sure it's not a singular UK problem that it's not valued that way, but we also have to give the confidence that as a European Union we are supporting these environments. We are supporting these young people who go out, who go to university, who then go into business, who want to do research, who want to contribute to inventions, to changing the world in a positive way, so that actually what you've been describing will not happen. But what we only can do as politicians is this, this term is to engage into dialogue with industries and to create an environment where they see the value. But to achieve what we want to do is to make Europe, the European Union, the top center in the world, the center of gravity, if to say so, of research, development, and forthcoming ideas. This is a combined effort. We need young people going to the jobs, showing there's interest. In my home country, in Germany, we have such a huge lack of scientists and researchers, we, for the next generation, we need these people and in other European states as well. So what we can do is contribute to set up this framework. I would be lying to you if I would say we can solve this problem tomorrow or we as politics can tell industries you have to pay this much to keep people into science. If they don't get it, they're dead damn dumb. If they don't understand why it's important that we have this in Europe and we don't outsource it to China, the US or other places, then obviously something has been gone wrong in those minds. So our job as politicians is to, to push, to drive and to ensure that there's environment. I know it's not the most satisfying answer, but this is the maximum we can do. And again, what we have to do, because it's a combined effort, we have to engage with society, industry, politics to make this happen, one of us alone won't make it happen. Again, I know it's not 100% satisfactory because it does not solve the issue why certain industries pay less, but I don't think, and that would be maybe in interesting, you probably don't become an astronaut because you're into the money, huh? You're into the view you have when you're up there. <laughs> but uh, I, don't, I don't know what you did. You were the longest person out, outside, of, of, well, in the orbit, actually. How does that feel, by the way? Well. Um, and sorry I for interrupting. It felt that good that I didn't uh, want to go back. Just sorry for interrupting. Are you never? I always question that when I see you people out there doing the work. Are you never afraid, like to just to drift away? Well, I uh, had some physics at school, so I, I knew that wouldn't happen. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, it, it actually, uh, the discussion is very interesting. I'd like to con continue a little bit on that uh, because I also hear people with physics background, lawyers, getting into something totally different. I was trained as a medical doctor, and uh, had, uh, and then I that was in the cold uh, the cold war, and I never would have thought that I would become, say, a co-pilot of a Russian spaceship, and but that still happened. So uh, you can go a lot of directions with your studies, and science is is. Uh, uh, very interesting uh, area, and but it doesn't mean that you that you have to continue in that field. You can go in a lot of different directions. I see that from a, a lot of people, it's the interest in and the curiosity of people that that brings them further. And what I what I heard, uh, I was uh, yeah a bit surprised uh, to to hear that it was so so difficult to find uh, find jobs because. I hear more and more in Germany, also in, in, uh, in my country, in Holland, uh, that uh, industries need people uh, with, with, uh, with uh, science and technology backgrounds because of, the, of all the developments that are taking place there. And they're running behind. They cannot get enough people. So uh, and the nice thing of space flight uh, is that you show how interesting science and technology is because you have all these different fields all these different uh, uh, technologies, all these, these different ways of thinking of, uh, of, the, uh, of the people that, that are working, the thousands of people that make it happen. And 
getting something in, 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 in space is difficult. I mean, you have enormous temperature differences. You have the vacuum. You have the vibrations, the, 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 the acceleration forces. So in order to get something into space, you have to think. You, have to, uh, you need people, young people especially, young people that have bright new ideas for, hey, let's do it this way. And therefore, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, so space flight is a nice inspiration, but science in general. My inspiration, besides science fiction, was uh, the, the television series Cosmos of Carl Sagan. So that was my hero, because that was, all of a sudden, science was interesting. How does that work? How does that work? And the fact that I started, started to study medicine at the same source, the same roots, as why I was interested in space flight. I, was, I, I saw this in science fiction uh, stories and uh, on television. How does this work? How do things work? And if then you, you also learn that there's a lot of scientists who, who uh, invent new things, who get in, into, into business as well. Don't forget there's a lot of people who studied uh, the, the hard sciences that started new companies. And, and, and that's, the, that's how, uh, how our wor world is, uh, is built, on the curiosity of people. People who think of something and then start to work it out. You know, they, they, they get involved with other people and they, they start a business and all of a sudden you have something fantastic that everybody uh, makes use of. So, for me, um, it was great to be in space <coughs> because of the fuel as well, but also because the, the whole field of all these new technologies was very interesting. And I was, work I was there 193 days working with all kinds of different disciplines. And there were a lot of times that I thought, wow, it would be great to work in that field and know more about that. And uh, there's so much interesting things to, to discover and then, and then work on it with a team and, and make it happen. Lady in the middle. My name is Sonne Kamerling, I'm from Holland too, and I, I really enjoyed the pictures of André Kuipers. He said on Twitter, on the sunrise behind the earth and stuff, it was really beautiful, we could enjoy it a little in Holland. Um, I was wondering, as you are astronauts and you have been to space for really long times, and as the, despite of the view, there must be some trouble when you're that long in uh, space, would you recommend this career to your children, to your own children? This is a question, good question for you, Andras. Please. Probably I shouldn't answer it since I neither have children nor uh, I have, I, <laughs> and I haven't been, uh, had, I haven't had the opportunity yet to uh, to work in space. So I'll let one of my colleagues answer it. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, when I wanted to become an astronaut, I uh, first of all thought this is not possible because this is something for uh, American test pilots. I didn't even think about the Russian space program because it was behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, and uh, so uh, when, I, uh, yeah, when I started uh, to, uh, to see that it be became a possibility, uh, the big thing for me was just try it because I didn't I didn't think it would happen, you know. I thought, okay, there's so many good people and the chance is so small. But the big thing is, if you don't try it, you never know. And you will always regret that you didn't try it. So I thought, okay, I'll try. If somebody says it's not happening, I can live with it. At least I tried. So I think that's an important thing. So if my kids, uh, who, who like much more uh, horses and things like that, so th I don't see that happen yet. Uh, they want to be veterinarians and uh, things like that. But well, look, I was a doctor, I came anyway into space. Um, so uh, if they would say uh, that they would try it, would like to try it, I would absolutely support it. Especially because if you have a drive, then a lot of things are possible. And, uh, and you absolutely should try it. Uh, and then, but be realistic that if it doesn't happen, you can still live with it. The road to the, to the goal should also be very nice. So people ask me a lot, how can I become an astronaut? Well. I always say you have to. You start, of course, you have to study something uh, technolo uh, technological or scientific, 
I mean, uh, with, with, with the language study, probably wouldn't happen, or it should be some kind of alien language that you master. That could happen. Uh, but uh, so you have to study something that you like, because if you like something, you're probably very good in it as well. And then, and then you never know what happens. So try it, and you can end up in very different places, as we heard already here. Uh, so the road should be good, and, and you never know what happens. If you don't try, you never know. Thank you. And maybe Frank can conclude this question because he has several kids, as far as I know. And maybe uh, to connect it with the uh, discussion which we had before about the, uh, you know, about tall people in the spaceship. So, like about the tall people, how can you fit inside? <laughs> Yeah, I have indeed uh, also three kids and uh, I also think that uh, none of the three of them will end up in the space business. They have chosen uh, other careers. But again, this is not very important. Uh, if somebody asked me, yes, I would absolutely recommend it. It's a fantastic career, uh, not only because of the view, as Andre said, but uh, space also unites people. We are working together with people from around this planet, with Russian colleagues. Uh, again, in, in the first Star Trek series, we had a Russian uh, engineer or uh, technical officer on, on the spaceship in the 60s. Uh, imagine uh, a Russian guy there. Uh, so that was very inspiring and now we are doing it. We are flying together with the Russians, the Americans, the Russians, the Japanese, who knows in the future who will all uh, bring all, all these people together. So working with all these people, all these communities together is also very satisfying. Then you have the science, you have the technology, you have the operational skills. It's, it's really very interesting, so I would absolutely recommend it. But as for Andre, what I would even more recommend to young people as they need to choose something they like. If you think that you're going to choose a certain career part or a certain education because you want to become an astronaut, only that, but you don't like what you're studying, it's probably not going to work. Because first of all, the, the chances to become an astronaut, unfortunately, today are still very low. I hope in the future that this will improve. But secondly, you see that people get good in their jobs because they are inspired, they like what they are doing, then they invest a lot of time. They don't see it as work, they see it as a hobby. And this is the case at least for all the astronauts that I know. They don't see being an astronaut as work, they see being an astronaut as a hobby. It's hard work, yes, but they see it as a hobby. They, they like what they are doing. And this is the most important thing for young people. They need to invest their time in something they like, and then they will get good at it, and then they will have a satisfying life. Thank you. I think that uh, all of us would like to have this kind of hobby, like you have, <laughs> at least myself, for sure. So, question? And uh, there was one, two. OK, so first, please. I'm Andreas Hechtel, I'm a civil engineer, and uh, regarding the space jump from Felix Baumgartner, I'm curious, the highest level I've been is in, from an aeroplane, and uh, Earth still seems like a flat. The question to the astronauts, my question would be, from what height um, do you see the Earth being curved, or being the edges of the Earth? The images I saw on TV, I thought maybe it, the camera had a, fr a frog eye, so my question, from what height do you see the Earth being round? Once, once. Well, okay. um, first of all, uh, I don't know what, what, if you use the frog eye or, or not, but uh, it, it's, it's not uh, something new. I mean, if you, uh, in the past, when you had the, the starfighters, the F-104, they went very high, and that, that's the, it became already dark. People could already see see, uh, see stars. So even with planes, that uh, that can already happen. And yeah, it's it's a it's a gradual process. So the higher you get, the more uh, curved it gets, of course. So uh, there's not a real point where you can see it. Uh, if we are in the rocket, this, the, the Soyuz rocket, we cannot see outside until we are at about, say, 80 kilometers altitude. Then the, the cover, the aerodynamic cover, falls off, and then you can look outside, and it's clearly dark then and, and curved. Uh, but there's not a, a specific point where you say, okay, now it becomes curved. It's a gradual process. Thank you. Um, there was a question from this part. Uh, in the back. Hello, I'm Federico, and I'm a student, and I would like to be an astronaut. Uh, I was just wondering uh, if in the next future we, we, 
will be able to visit Mars? And Very good question. Andreas? Maybe you are the future. Yes, uh, he, you are the future. So he still <laughs> haven't been up there, but he has the knowledge to do that. So maybe he can have some, uh, some information about the curiosity. When it comes to a manned Mars mission, I would say that today we have the technology to do it. In fact, today we are much closer to realizing a manned, mis uh, manned mission to Mars than uh, NASA was in the early 60s in realizing a manned mission to the moon. Um, of course, it's going to be difficult. Uh, we're talking about, uh, with technology of today, we're talking about a, a round-trip mission time of two and a half to three years, six months there, a surface stay on Mars of about a year and a half in order to wait for the planets to uh, get into a favorable position before the astronauts can return, uh, followed by six months back. So we're talking really about a, a very long trip of two and a half years, but I, I certainly think that we have the, the understanding and the uh, capabilities to achieve it. Uh, what we're lacking perhaps is the political will. Um, so really, I can just uh, encourage you to uh, push for uh, space uh, as much as possible. And then hopefully, uh, in the not too distant future, uh, the politicians will, will hear it and, uh, and uh, help all of us realize that dream. Because I really think Mars is the next uh, uh, destination. Whether or not we decide to go back uh, to the moon first or to a, an asteroid on the way, uh, scientists are more or less all in agreement that, that Mars is the, is the real destination because it's such an interesting uh, place. We know that in the past Mars was uh, much warmer than it is today. It had a, a much thicker atmosphere which most likely enabled liquid water to, to exist on the surface uh, in the form of uh, seas and oceans. And with the presence of liquid water, well, maybe, just maybe, uh, there w once existed life, not necessarily intelligent life, but uh, microbial or bacterial life. And that really is what uh, makes Mars such an interesting destination. Yeah. Thank you very much. So it came back to us, Alex. We need to change the situation to go to Mars. I saw a question here. Um, we stopped going to Strasbourg. Yeah, we stopped um, going. That's a good idea. We stopped traveling to Strasbourg and we go to Mars. Very good. So uh, please. Vaibhav Mukundan from India. Uh, currently, I'm a stagiar in DG Connect. And uh, my question is regarding uh, being in orbit, actually. Uh, being an astronaut is always going to have its highs and lows. So, what would you uh, say is the most. Uh, enjoyable thing uh, and what would be the most annoying thing being in orbit as an astronaut? As a woman astronaut, yes. We have men here. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. It's open question. Okay. I, I think there are not really any differences, uh, gender differences, uh, once you are in orbit. At least uh, in my crew, we had uh, Nicole Stott for uh, three months, and uh, I did not see any differences uh, on gender. Uh, what is the, the, one of the most interesting things, uh, of course, as Andre already said, uh, looking out, uh, out of the window is, is very nice in orbit. Uh, because, it's, uh, first of all, it's a very nice view, but also because when you look outside, there are two things that you notice very clearly. And you talk to any astronaut, and it's, it's very important. First of all is the vulnerability of our planet. Uh, if you look here, it's a nice day today, a little bit cloudy, but still, if you look upside and you see blue sky, a lot of people have the impression that the blue sky just goes on to infinity. If you look from above to our planet, we see that actually our planet has just like a small eggshell around it which protects it, which gives us life, which uh, gives us all the, uh, everything that exists here on our planet. And it looks in this immense cosmos extremely, extremely vulnerable. And as Professor Glover has announced uh, in, uh, or has said in, in one of the last view graphs, uh, we are kind of in a pre-warp civilization. We are not taking very good care of our planet. And I think we need to realize this more and more. I know that uh, on the EU side, uh, we are 
putting a lot of emphasis on this. Uh, I think we need to uh, bring this further to the global forum as well, that people start realizing that the way we are conducting business, the way we are living as we are today is not sustainable. Imagine that everybody on the planet, 7 billion people, have one or two cars and start driving their cars as I personally as well, I'm the first, vic I'm the first guilty one, I'm not objecting to that, uh, start doing that. This is not sustainable. So we need to find solutions to make our planet sustainable in the long term because after all, our planet is just an enormous spaceship in an even bigger galaxy. Uh, because we are a closed system. Uh, the second thing that you see from, from orbit and that, uh, that you bring back is the fact that there are no boundaries. Boundaries is something that we, as human beings, have created. They are purely artificial. They do not exist if you look from above. And so there as well I would like to join the Star Trek series where I'm very much inspired by the, the Federation of Planets. And in one of the, the uh, speeches that I made for an exploration conference is that I would like to see here on Earth a federation of societies, societies without boundary that together work for the future, not against each other but with each other. If we combine all our capabilities of 7 billion people here on Earth, we for sure are capable of bringing a much better future for everybody, for every citizen here on the Earth. And this is the second thing that I brought back from my space flight and that for the next 10, 15 years that I'm active in the European Space Agency will continue to work on and to bring this federation of societies together in bigger projects of cooperation like the International Space Station. What is not so nice on orbit? Well, of course, you, uh, uh, in the beginning you get a little bit of space sick. Uh, you don't have uh, showers. Uh, you, you can't, uh, no, no showers, no bath. 300 milliliters of water to wash every single day. Uh, you eat out of packets uh, for six months. You have uh, very little uh, privacy. You have just a, a small sleeping bag to sleep in. Uh, I can go on and on and on and on. Uh, there are a lot of things that are not very nice in space flight and that uh, people would probably uh, not endure very well on Earth. But the two things that I've mentioned the, the vulnerability of our planet and the fact that I can bring back this message to people like you here, to the European Parliament, and the fact that through human spaceflight we can bring societies here on Earth together to solve the problems of the future. These are really the two things that uh, for me are the highlights of my spaceflight. the question from this side, please. Lady? <laughs> okay, so um, this is a question directed to the politicians attending this um, <laughs> conference. Um, uh, you keep stressing the fact that it's necessary to have a broad budget for science and that it's very important to realize our fantasies as to uh, the scientific aspect, but isn't it more important to focus on um, having, a, um, having a steady economical foundation first before we start fantasizing about realizing all these scientific extra things for ourselves, um, which might not be the main issue in, well, right now? Well, definitely we need a sound economical basis, you're right. I mean, um, you don't have to be Bill Clinton to say it's economy stupid. So um, that, is, that is actually an approach that without a sound economic basis, you won't be able to concentrate and to work on research and development. But on the other hand, one might think about that one triggers the other as well. If you think about, now most of you probably have on your phones or if you still have sort of a separate device, MP3 files in terms of music. These have been inventions which have been made also in Europe and developed in force and now there are vital businesses which are actually running on them. Um, issues like, like the video record, the video cassette, which is ancient history for most, um, has been developed in Europe. So what we actually <clears throat> have to keep in mind 
is that we can sort of enhance through research and development also our economic foundation by triggering the market, by bringing on new products, by inventing it. If you think about sort of the World Wide Web as we know it wouldn't be possible without the internet and which has been something which has been also developed in Europe. It has been in military use also in other countries, but this is something where we can see that we had groundwork research. We had people who believed in this idea of decentralized connection of computers, of exchanging data throughout the possibilities there are. And now we have something which is the internet, which allows us to communicate, to work on further. And um, I, I believe also in the point uh, our colleague Amelia made is something we have to think about in terms of to have research development going on. How much do we think about is information really exclusive in a world nowadays? Or isn't it more that with the technologies we have to share to get the minds triggered which are going on? And I know she's working a lot on these issues, so if I start now to talk, I'm an amateur compared to what she's doing. But to, to answer your question, I don't think it can be either or. I think it's usually doing one thing without forgetting to do the other stuff as well. And um, I do believe that research and development and being able to fund that is a significant contribution actually to our economy. But, but this is my personal opinion. I'm not sure if there's some sort of official opinion on that one, but I do believe without the one, we won't have the other. Thank you. And now the official. <laughs> okay, I, I wouldn't claim to be the official view, but I, I, it's a very interesting question. And, and I just want to say something about our future. I think our future in Europe is based on knowledge. It will be based, our future economy has to be based on something. And it won't be based on abundant natural resources. It won't be based on being able to be cheaper than everyone else in producing things. It will be based on being smarter than other people. Because that's our history. That's what we have in the past. That's where we are now in terms of the impact of our knowledge. And that's what we have to offer. People in Europe, but globally, that's what we have to offer in the future. So if you say it's fantasy and uh, we should focus on the economy, the economy has to be based on something. How do we deal with an aging population? We deal with an aging population by inventing technology, about imagining ways that people who are housebound can still be mentally active by being able to, my vision is that when I'm old and I want to have coffee with people but maybe I can't leave my house, I can beam them into my house and I can beam myself into their house and I might even be able to change my appearance so that I look like Angelina Jolie instead of myself uh, when I get beamed in and indeed I might beam in George Clooney instead of whoever it is that I'm thinking of. These things, they seem like fantasy, but we can make them happen and it's not, it's not frivolous. We will have to change. The future will be different from today. That's the only thing we can say with certainty, but we can invent it. And I think that's the important thing for me, is the economy doesn't have to be how many pounds are in the bank or what your deficit is. The economy also needs to pay attention to what we have as a resource. And it was said right at the beginning of today, the most important thing we have as a resource is, is in our heads. And we've got a flying start, so I really hope we use it. Thank you. Um, there was a point from Amelia, very short, and then we ask the question, please. Um, yes, well, it, it's actually combined with the question. So uh, my first uh, observation is that modern science fiction very often is about the problems of society, and it's about what happens when you restrict information. I read a lot of science fiction. I, I still watch a lot of science fiction. And it's a big hobby of mine. Um, the assemblers of Charles Stross perfectly describe the technology that Professor Glover wants for her old age in the novel by his called um, Glass House, uh, which is about uh, the horrible consequences of dictatorship and authoritarian rule on society where communication is very controlled. Um, but I thought maybe it would be interesting to bring in the perspective of uh, Walter Koenig on on file sharing, again, because I have to come back to this point, it's very important to me. Uh, because you are actually um, part of the craftsmanship that we are trying to protect, 
um, through the uh, measures that at least I feel are very problematic to me. Okay, I think this no, will no, be the... No, 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 he's, he's doing something. I think creative properties belong to the people who create them. And uh, I, I, it is, it, in the same way, it is not right to, uh, to give away books without a royalty uh, being paid. Uh, I don't think it's, 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 it's proper to uh, give away anybody's creative work. Uh, this is a society where uh, we, 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 we barter with money. We, we, uh, we need to survive. It's, it's one of the strong motivations. And, it's, and needing money is, is, uh, is a good motivation, as long as you're not robbing banks. Um, I, I, I do think that uh, I think there's greater uh, motivation. And if, if you're a little... If you're a little uh, if your stomach's a little empty and um, you get the you get the work done uh, more quickly, I don't think it I don't think it involves I don't think it involves creativity. I I, I don't I don't mean I don't think um, the money is necessarily um, germane to, to the, the quality of the project, uh, but but I think the quality of the project should be rewarded. Uh, otherwise. People uh, uh, would not be writing. They, they would probably feel they're just doing it for themselves. And how, we, how are we going to learn, learn if, unless we, uh, unless we uh, get to read some, some wonderful uh, literature and, and, and learn from it and learn how to write ourselves? And uh, I think there would be less incentive to do so Oh man, am I making this up? <laughs> Less incentive to do so if we didn't pay for it. So in any case, be, you know, I think everybody should be proud of their work, and their work should be compensated for. And uh, and um, I know that because I have a couple of friends who who uh, write science fiction and whose name you, 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 I'm sure you've probably heard, uh, who uh, took. Uh, uh, big, big publishers to task, filed suits, and won, ultimately. And I think they won with, with full justification. Um, it's their work. They created it. They should be recognized for it. Does that sort of answer your question? Um. <laughs> Okay, it thank you. It does and it doesn't, um, because you say that it's important with compensation, but you did not specify that it has to be made through the purchase of individual copies. 
which is the foundation of copyright. So sort of and sort of not. It's a very inspirational. Well, uh, how, how and I don't necessarily disagree with you, just to make that clear. How will they be paid if, if not through, through their copyright? Bananas? Okay, thank you very much for this nice intervention. I would like to ask for a big applause and we will move to another question. Uh, there was a lady in the middle, please. Um, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Antonia. I come from Bulgaria. We are a group of students here. And my question is actually about space tourism. And I think Frank already touched upon it a little bit. And he said, well, it will be so nice that in the future everybody will be able to go to space. And we saw a picture of Richard Branson, a European role model whose company is actually working towards an affordable way of us going to space. But my question is, do you believe that space should be open for that kind of business ideas, or do you think it should be solely for research and for science and for what we can get out of the, the technology that we work with there? So I understand there's enough space in space, but I'm just wondering if perhaps the opinion of the astronauts would actually be different from the opinion of ANS on that matter. Well, so thank you. Uh, if you look at the history uh, of, the, of technology, I mean, People were going on to seas, and first there were some people who dared to, to cut out a tree and do that. And, and then, in the end, everybody was on the boat. And same with aviation. Uh, some people had to dare it first, then it becomes uh, yeah, commercial, and in the end, everybody flies here and there. The same thing will happen with space. So it's just, it's just the, the, the next frontier, to say so. And uh, so that, this will happen. Of course, we have to be, make very sure that it happens in a good way. I mean, if it turns out that all these this suborbital flies punch holes in the ozone layer and cause a chemical reaction or whatever, then it's not a good idea. So we have to make very sure that, that uh, space tourism is, is, is good or good. It's not that bad for the environment. So that, that's, that's one of the things. But uh, this is a very uh, big economical factor. And if you can make money somewhere, things go very fast. If you find something special on the moon, well, in no time they will be, uh, they will be, uh, will be mining on the moon and whatever. So, and, and tourism is a huge economic factor, of course. So these are the first steps. It will happen. People will go to hotels orbiting the Earth. Uh, it sounds like science fiction, but, you know, flying across the ocean was also one science fiction. So it, it will happen, and I hope we are sound enough to, to prevent that it damages our planet even more than, uh, than we're already doing now. Thank you, Frank. Okay, nothing to add for that. So then I would like to go as, as, as well as the, as the tourists to the space and maybe buy some uh, property at the moon in the future. We will see. Okay, there was a nice question in the middle. A lady, please. Thank you. It wasn't actually a question, it was something additional. Um, I am a physician from Greece, so further explanation and introduction about crisis and about fund, funding, it's unnecessary. So um, what I want to say in additional years for the young people, I think that the spirit of Star Trek is here and Mr. Koenig is just shown us to us because he changed the rules that it is the, the message uh, there is always a solution, and we have to find it. He changed the rules, he just, he couldn't go from this side, and he changed his way to speak with uh, our young friend. And as uh, maybe I remember well, it was uh, James T. Kirk at the films of the movie, and uh, he was changing the rules, not cheating, but changing the rules on his favorite and sometimes spoke, he wasn't lying, he was just exaggerating. So I think that is the, the, the message for the young people. There is always a way and you always have to go there and find it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I know that there is one gentleman asking for the floor for a long time. 
Yeah. Um, I'm Emmanuel Fallon. I'm a spokesman for the for the for the European Parliament. I must, of course, I'm a Star Trek fan, as uh, everyone here, I suppose, uh, science fiction fan, and Katarina's fan also. Because uh, thank you to organize this kind of event today. Uh, my question is quite simple and short. Uh, when you become an astronaut or a cosmonaut and uh, you go on space, when you are coming back on Earth, do you have still have a dream? Is it to, to meet Angelina Jolie, like said uh, Mrs. Clover before? Or is it to go on Mars? Or is it to, use the, to be the first one to use the teleportation or whatever? What, what is your personal dream when you come back on Earth? Thank you. Yes, I, I still have a lot of dreams. Uh, I think also my previous intervention explained it a little bit. If, if I can, in the next 10 years, do two things. Uh, first of all, uh, help bringing Europe uh, together in a bigger integration in Europe here, here in the European Parliament, uh, and, and push science and technology to build a better society, an even better society for the European citizen. Uh, this is certainly something that I want to dream uh, about and that I'm still working about. And of course, as the European Astronaut Center and with our European Astronaut Corps, we are a core of what we call true Europeans. Somebody asked me uh, when I came in this morning, uh, from where are you? Are you Belgium from the north, from the south? I said, I am a European. And we truly, as European astronauts, we believe that. If they ask us where are you from, we say we are European astronauts from Belgian nationality. But this is already the second part. And I think this core element of Europe and bringing Europe together, and I, I, I believe it's the only way that we will be able to survive and to maintain our quality of life in Europe in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, if I can contribute to that, because of course I'm an only very small partner, uh, particle in there, uh, this is still one of my dreams to, to live this and to see this united Europe coming together. The second thing is, uh, which I also uh, mentioned, is this uh, federation of societies. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that I will not see one global government with the president of the earth. Uh, I don't think that I will see this in my lifetime. But I hope that I can see in my lifetime that we bring societies closer together, like we have done in Europe. Uh, uh, we have just last week uh, gotten the Nobel Prize for uh, Peace with the European Union, uh, because we have 60 years, more than 60 years of non-conflict in the continent. This has not happened since the continent existed, more than 60 years. Uh, if we can bring this spirit to the societies, to other societies in the world, and we can bring these societies together and work in a peaceful way together, this is also something that I, uh, that I hope to work on. And I think human spaceflight is a very good vehicle to start cooperating in this way. Former enemies, uh, the US and Russia, have decided to work together in an international space station. Today, every single day, 24 hours per day, seven days a week, 365 days per year, high-level scientists, uh, engineers, operational people are working together to maintain an infrastructure in orbit, which is the most advanced technological cooperation that has ever been built by the world. This is, if we can extend this to other societies, this is what I'm also dreaming about. Andreas, I think that one of your dreams is to come up finally <laughs> in some years, but maybe if there is something else, would you would like to say what is your dream in the future? What do you believe in? You're right that my concrete dream, of course, is to, uh, to be part of a mission to the International Space Station. But it's also more than that. I would say, in much broader terms, my dream is to be part of the future. Because really, the European Space Agency uh, and all the activities that we have in space is about the future uh, and about shaping the future. And I'm not talking about just five years from now or 10 years from now. I'm talking about what will our society look like 500 years from now? And really, I'm not even going to try to predict what it, what it will, what kind of society we'll have 500 years from now because it's, it's so far out that I, I can't even begin to imagine. But what we're doing now is really taking the first few steps towards that future. And 
and the first few steps towards determining what role space will play in that future. I'm sure it'll have some, some role, but what role, I don't know. And we're not trying to predict it, but we're trying to take those first steps in order to, to see what may come. Um, so really, my, my dream is, is to be part uh, in shaping our future. Andrei, you stayed there for a very long time, the longest, uh, yes. actually. So what was the dream when you were coming back? <laughs> and what is the dream for the future? Well, my dream for the future uh, has to do with, uh, with the planet as a, uh, as, a, as a system. Because you see a lot of light. It's beautiful. The Earth by night is beautiful. But you also realize how many people are living here. And it's growing, growing, growing. Within no time, we are now at seven. So within no time, we are at eight or nine uh, billion. And uh, so, uh, I want to make, yeah, to help, uh, to make clear to, to people on Earth who listen uh, with, with a lot of interest to stories about space, to also make clear that the planet is very beautiful, but very limited. So uh, the oceans are being emptied, the forests are disappearing, and it's, you know, the planet is not getting bigger. The population is getting bigger, but the planet is not getting bigger. So we, we need to find a way to, uh, to make it sustainable, so that we have to give the Earth the chance to recover. I mean, it's good to use the Earth, but make it, make it happen that it recovers. So that's something that I like to, to put uh, effort in. Uh, in the context of telling how beautiful and interesting the planet is, also making make clear how vulnerable and how limited. And what was the first dream when you were coming back? What was the first thing you wanted the most, uh, except the shower? Well, but the shower is actually not a good idea, <laughs> because if you're very dizzy, you can hardly walk, and you try to, you are, you're almost fainting, and if you take a hot shower, then not a good idea. So the shower was not a good idea. But uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the first thing, of course, it's, it's a, a general thing uh, that to, to call the family, but one thing I liked very much, that was we had a stopover in Scotland, and then the sun was going down and it had rained, of course, it's Scotland. It rained. <laughs> and then I smelled the wet grass there. It was sitting on the, on the tarmac, on the, uh, say, on, on, the, on the taxiway beside the plane. It was quiet. And then smelling the grass. And I thought, this is great. Space is beautiful. Being in a space is fantastic. But it's all metal, artificial materials. And then to smell wet grass, it was fantastic. We need to be careful with our nature here. Professor Glauber, what do you think about it? Um, well, maybe this is the time to tell you all that I did apply to become an astronaut, <laughs> but I'm a reject. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> so um, that was in the 80s when there was a competition in the UK to select um, uh, a member uh, of the UK who would join an international uh, space team. So I, I didn't make it. But I've had a great life, so it doesn't really matter. So it, I think just to go back to an earlier point, it's great to have dreams. That was one of mine. I had lots of other ones. Many of those have come true. So it doesn't matter if one thing doesn't come true. Others will. So, so that's fine. But um, in terms of just looking to the future, what, one of the things for me is, and I, I want to say this about science, science is a great example for me of equality, and I think one of the things our planet lacks big time is equality. Everything is very poorly spread out amongst the population. But science is the one thing, it doesn't matter what your background is, what your ethnicity is, uh, whether you're male or female. If you have a passion for science, it might be harder if you're one of these things or easier, but nevertheless, if you have the passion for science, you can do it. It's you that's in control. And I think that's a really important thing. Science doesn't mind. It only minds about your ideas, your imagination, your excellence in the area that you're pursuing. And, and that's why it, it underpins for me this idea of equality. Um, so I, I think for me, the future, more people embracing science, and I don't mean that I want a world full of scientists, but I want more people to enjoy science, because every aspect of our life, 
from the minute we wake in the morning till the minute we go to sleep at night. Science, engineering and technology is delivering travel, weather forecast, smart materials, uh, food, safe water, clean water, entertainment, all of these things delivered to you by science. It's just fun the more you find out about it. And so for me, equality and people joining in in that culture and, and really just having fun with scientists, not having scientific backgrounds. And one more thing, I'd like it if the European Parliament, if all the parliamentarians were scientists. I think that would be an interesting thing. Okay, one lawyer, the rest scientists. <laughs> And Mr. Kenning, you inspired the dreams of many people like mine to, to think about the stars. So what is your dream in the end? What do you think about the well, future? I think that evolution is an ongoing process. It never stops. And uh, when, we have, when we have solved all the problems on this earth, when we have grown and developed and learned uh, <clears throat> to live with each other, you know, in, in, in good fellowship, when our technology has reached its zenith and our, our compassion is w without contest, then we're going to go to the, we're going, we're going to the stars because it's, it's the destiny, it's destiny. Man will, will have the intellect. He'll have all the building, bar, building blocks from all the work that has been, that gone on before. And he will have to go to the, we'll have to continue out. He'll have to search. Because if we have the capacity to do that, I, I cannot conceive of, of it not happening. It may take 5,000 years, may take 10,000 years. We might destroy half the planet getting there. But I do believe that it is, it is part of, of, of who we are that we, that we continue to go on and search and uh, find out what else there is. That, that seems to me a given. Thank you very much. And now the last question I promised to the gentleman in the very far right from my side. Thank you. Uh, Fabrizio Sestini from DigiConnect. Uh, to me, uh, one of the most striking or the most striking thing in Star Trek is the absence of money. There is, uh, there is never any money exchange between people, between the crew members, uh, with other planets, uh, nowhere. And so, uh, in the first times I was watching Star Trek, I was asking myself, how is it possible that a society without money can thrive and even go to the stars? And then I realized something which is very similar to what Andre said, that uh, when you are in the space and uh, uh, when these people belong to a federation without borders, without countries, then maybe also money doesn't make sense because uh, uh, in the end, the resources, the natural resources you have available are uh, finite, and so you have to make do between uh, all the people of the planets with the same uh, resources. So in this sense, uh, uh, I appreciated your uh, contribution. And also, uh, I think this goes in the line of what Anne said, uh, the importance of knowledge. Because uh, to exchange knowledge and uh, to produce knowledge in the most effective manner, you have to reduce the uh, monetary value of knowledge or possibly to abolish it as uh, uh, Amelia was advocating. So, but then, uh, uh, just to make it short, uh, I heard from Mr. Chekhov that he reminded us that Star Trek, of course, was a fiction made for money. And then I wonder, uh, then uh, if living without money is a utopia, maybe also going to the stars is a utopia, or maybe we can still believe in both of these things. Well, I think this was a nice comment to conclude. Uh, now I will ask the panelists to say some last thing which you would like young people 
to keep with them for the rest of their life, believe, and how we can support them to study science, which was the topic of this discussion. Where we start? We start with the youngest one, please. A part of me, of course. <laughs> I suppose I'd uh, like to conclude by just saying, not just follow your dreams, um, but be flexible. Because I really think the, uh, the key to success is uh, flexibility. Circumstances change, and you might find yourself in a situation that uh, you didn't foresee or, or didn't uh, expect. But grab the opportunities that come to you uh, because when you grab opportunities, that's when you, uh, uh, that's when you are the most successful. And I think uh, from my personal life, um, there's exa uh, one example uh, especially. It, it was always my dream to be an astronaut and to work uh, in the space industry. But when I graduated with my first degree as an engineer, there weren't a lot of options within aerospace. Um, but one thing that did open up to me was an opportunity to work in the oil industry. And I ended up on an oil platform kilometers off the coast of West Africa, drilling for oil. And people used to say to me, I thought you wanted to be an astronaut, and now you're drilling for oil. Luckily, it was about the same time that uh, the movie, movie Armageddon came out, so I could say, well, don't worry, in the future they're going to need drillers in space as well. <laughs> but it's not just that, because it actually came up during my interview to be an astronaut. Um, and I'm certain that I wouldn't be sitting here in front of you today if I hadn't taken that opportunity, because working on an oil platform Although it's not the same as working on a space station, it still has some of the same uh, stressors. You're isolated, you have to work together in a difficult environment to solve a job, uh, and you're a, a small group of people. And that is relevant experience. Uh, and I'm certain that if I hadn't taken that opportunity, I wouldn't be sitting here in front of you today. So really, that's what I'd like to conclude with, is take the opportunities that, uh, that come to you, and the world is open to you. Thank you. Frank? Yes, I'm, I'm going to be very short. Uh, I have two proverbs, actually one that is uh, from uh, a French writer already in the uh, 1800s that uh, wrote, if you want to achieve something, you must not only dream, you also need to believe. And you must not only plan, you also need to act. And I think this is true for everybody for us. It's true for Europe and it's true for our world. And regarding space flight, regarding Star Trek, I'm a big fan of the next generation. And if you look to the first episode of Star Trek, the next generation, they are circling one of these class M planets and I forgot the name, but the series ends with uh, Captain Picard uh, just saying to, uh, uh, the first officer there, let's see what's out there. Engage. <laughs> nice. Andre, please. Yes. Um, well, I always have, have to, well, actually, it's a, it's a negative thing or negative. It will happen to us one, or one day. I want, and that goes for everybody, I think, I hope, that on the day that I die, that I have the feeling I did something useful and that I helped human, humankind a little bit further. And it can be a very small thing because that's the only thing we can do as individuals, a very small thing. And it can be in a lot of different fields. But I want to have the feeling that I, that I uh, contributed something. And science is a fantastic way, science technology is a fantastic way to do that, to, to help us all a little bit further so we can all uh, enjoy it. So I hope you find this little thing that you can do. Alexander? Oh, geez. This is not prepared. 
No, I did not. Um, we see if you are really a politician and you can speak about everything. Oh, well, I mean, first of all, you, you have to do what you believe in and then believe in what you do. And secondly, I would say never accept under no circumstances if people tell you you cannot do that because there's always somebody who will firstly do something where everybody saw it, this is impossible. And I hope the three guys on here and Mr. Koenig gave you the inspiration not to believe anybody who will tell you you can't do that because you always can. Yes, we can. And uh, continue <laughs> with Mrs. Glover, Professor Glover. Some care more. Okay, thank you. Um, I was inspired by something that Frank said earlier today, and that was that one of the wonderful things looking out the window was that the earth has no boundaries. And what I would say to you is, actually, there really are not many boundaries. Boundaries are mostly in your head. Um, but we tend to be very conventional for some reason, and particularly for the younger people in the audience, don't let there be boundaries in your head. It's echoing what Alexander just said. Um, you, you just need to want to do it and find a way to do it. The other thing is to remember you're in control. Your future will depend on what you decide, not someone else. So, so you make the decision about what you want to do and you find the way of making it happen. That, that, that's, that's how it works and it does really work that way. So I, I would just leave with you, you with two things, th those two things and one more thing. Be brave. It's always easy to say no. It's sometimes very hard to say yes that's challenging. This is true whether you're a politician, whether you're a scientist, whether you're a lawyer or an accountant. It's sometimes easy to take a step into the slightly unknown. So let's be a bit braver. I'll leave you with that. So the words from the brave person, the woman chief scientist of the European Union. I'm proud. <laughs> and the last, Mr. Koenig. Well, actually, I'm, I'm tempted to say nothing uh, because everybody has, has said it. In one way or another, we, there, everybody has said the same thing. But I'm an actor, and I don't give up the microphone very easily. <laughs> so in, in my own words, actually, they're the, the words of other people, but I have, uh, I have uh, embraced them as my own. I, th I think that when we die, that's it. We're not, we're not going to heaven, and, and we're not going to be rewarded somewhere else. So what is the purpose of a life? Why are we here? And what I've come to is feel a sense of actualization, that our purpose is to do as much as we can to fulfill our potential. That is what, that's the most noble thing a human being can do. I'm talking obviously in, in positive terms. Uh, it, it, that our life was significant in that regard. We did as much as we could to fulfill our potential. And of course, those are the, those are the building blocks of what people bring after them. And that's, and that's how uh, life moves on and becomes better and, and uh, and in in, in also ca causes chaos. But ultimately, it, it's, it's the building blocks of where we go next. Each one of us, if we live the most we can, the best way we can, become the building blocks of the future. My throat is giant. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, just to conclude, I believe that this made sense and all this event made sense. So one of my dreams came true. I met the real Star Trek commander. I met the real commander in space, in life, really real ones. Uh, I met a woman chief scientist. I met a very nice people uh, here in this room and uh, I believe that uh, 
at least you remember something from this conference and it, that everything can make a difference and everybody, each of you, can make a difference. And this is the important point which we wanted you to say, that science matters and science rules. Thank you very much for coming.